welcome to the All Brands Show. I'm Barbara from All Brands, and we're so excited to be talking about stabilizers today. How many times have you been working on a project and you're like, what stabilizer am I supposed to use for this fabric combination? Well, we brought in the expert. Her name is Deborah Jones, and I'll be bringing her in in just a moment. I just wanted to make a one announcement. At the end of this broadcast, we'll be giving away a $50 allbrands.com e-gift card, so please be sure to comment hashtag all brands and one more thing we're so excited we're almost to 10,000 followers on our youtube channel so if you haven't yet please hop on over to our youtube channel and click that bell to subscribe if you're watching from facebook please follow us there and we hope that you enjoy it and i'm going to be bringing in deborah and here she is hey honey oh i'm sorry Hi, Barbara. <laughs> You're amazing. You know so much about stabilizer, and I feel like I don't know anything. Well, Barbara, that's certainly not true. I've known you so long, and I know you could probably teach this class as well as I can, but we do have a lot to look at today, and I think that, you know, your, your fans and followers are going to enjoy uh, seeing at least a few tips they may not know. Yeah. Well, I get by because of, it. I think it's that maybe that circle in the background that embroiders compass that right. you invented right. is like my go-to for which stabilizers I'm going to use. And if I know anything about stabilizer, it's because of that amazing tool that, uh, that, we carry on our website, all brands. Well, thank you, Barbara. You know, that was really a, a, a neat uh, journey making that tool because it's got about 27 different fabric and sewing uh, or embroidery scenarios on it. So just about any fabric you're going to be embroidering on is covered on the compass. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh, here's one from Joanne Banco that's watching. Hey, Joanne. So many myths and misnomers about stabilizer, right? You bet. There are. You know, recently we've had the one where people say, if you wear it, don't tear it. You know, so it's kind of like if it fits, you must have quit kind of thing. You know, it sounds catchy, but may or may not necessarily be true. So we have to dig a little deeper than those quirky sayings, right? Oh, of course. Well, I can't wait to see all of this information that you're going to share with us today. So uh, I think that uh, you have... Do you have my PowerPoint available? Oh, yeah, here it is. <laughs> I'll bring it up right now. Okay. All right. And you'll just need to bring it up on your screen. Okay. I, that Let me, let, I'm going to have to stop screen and reshare. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, here we go. That's one thing I wasn't sure about. Okay, share and go to my PowerPoint. And... Okay, you and you and uh, we see it, correct? Yes. Okay, so you know, Barbara, I see so many different um, hacks. We'll call them on Facebook because sometimes we might be desperate and have to use something uh, that's not a normal embroidery stabilizer, uh, it, it, like paper towel. You know, back when I started embroidering, you know, back in the 60s, we didn't have all these engineered stabilizers and we really did use industrial paper towels uh, for stabilizers. Then like back in the 90s, people started using coffee filters and uh, and even dressmakers uh, stabilizer for cutaway. So fortunately, we don't have to do that anymore. We have very uh, sophisticated uh, solutions. And most stabilizers today that we use for embroidery are made out of polyester and cellulose and something to bind them together like latex. But exquisite stabilizers carried by all brands also contain silicone to lubricate your needle. So you can see that not all stabilizers are created equally. In fact, some are what we call 
dry laid and some are wet laid. And it's obvious to see that those are just terms that refer to how they're manufactured. Wet laid is made more like paper and dry laid has no liquid involved. So you can see that there's a big difference in the coverage of fibers. So that's why we used to be told to hoop two layers at opposing angles. I'm sure you remember that, Barbara. That's been taught for many years. And we were told to do that to counteract the poor quality uh, and the stretch of stabilizers. But only one layer of high quality stabilizer is needed today. So what we try to do today is match the fabric weight and stitch count to the stabilizer. So for example, in tearaway and cutaway, there are light, medium, and heavy weights. So you don't have to double up and um, we can conserve. So I mentioned tearaway and cutaway. Those are the two main types of stabilizer. And if the material stretches, we generally use cutaway. And that remains permanently under the embroidery and you have to cut it away with scissors. Whereas tearaway works best, in my opinion, for stable materials like woven fabrics. And you just tear it away from the edge of the embroidery. But there are two main types of tearaway. Do you know what they are? Oh, my goodness. I know what we're going to talk about today. <laughs> What's that? The dime firm tearaway and the medium soft tearaway. Yes, ma'am. You are so right. And, you know, the medium soft tearaway, a lot of people are really not familiar with this. And it's one of my faves. And I'll show you why. Uh, Here's the difference. The firm tearaway tears cleanly like paper because it's got more cellulose in it, which is what paper's made out of, and it's got less polyester in it. Whereas the soft tearaway, has, it tears more ragged and it's got more polyester in it. And you see those little fuzzy edges that it has. They look kind of hairy, doesn't it, Barbara? Um, mm -hmm. And that means that it's got more poly, less cellulose. So it's actually a hybrid between tearaway and cutaway. So here's the benefit of soft tearaway. A lot of people want their tearaway to tear really cleanly and leave nothing around the edges. And I get it. I, I like that too. But if you notice on the, this is the reverse side of a fill stitch circle. And if you notice on the right, that firm tearaway has broken down after the fill stitch circle has been stitched. So there's nothing there to support the outline. That's why I love a soft tearaway. So it clings onto the edges even after that fill stitch has been applied. And yes, it may tear away a little bit more uh, fibery, but not really after it's been uh, perforated. So see, that's a big difference and a big benefit. So, so here, here's a, a, I'm sorry, go ahead, Barbara. Oh, I was just going to say, I love, I love all of the information because <laughs> it's, it's so beneficial to know, like, if you're going to lose your stabilizer from doing a satin stitch on the back. <laughs> right. And we don't think about that because we really don't sometimes see that symptom and we wonder why things went off track like this. You see how this outline on this heart did not uh, follow the heart. It's think of it like that circle. The crisp tearaway was not there anymore to support this outline. Whereas being stitched with the soft tearaway um, or a cutaway, you could use a cutaway. Like I said, soft tearaway is a hybrid between cutaway and tearaway. So this heart was stitched with soft tearaway. And you see it stayed on track because it had something there to support that outline. That is such a benefit to know because if you're going to stitch a sweatshirt with, you know, your name across the front, you don't necessarily want that cutaway staying in the garment the whole time you know, a, a, a 
soft tear away will do the job. Now, however, on something like uh, this lightweight, light stitch count butterfly on a polyester windbreaker, hey, the firm tear away is definitely perfect for that job. It's going to give you a nice, clean, unpuckered result. And unpuckered is the key. Even this heavy, heavy stitch design, this is a big design, about eight inches, and it was stitched with heavy tearaway, heavy firm tearaway on a polyester or nylon, actually it's nylon drawstring bag. You know, those um, cinch bags like kids like to carry. They're pretty lightweight, but it supported this design with the heavy firm tearaway. And that's what I mean by matching your fabric and your design to your stabilizer. And here's a really cool picture that shows you that tearaway really will support a fill stitch design on a woven fabric. Here's a fully embroidered rooster, the front and the back. And you can see it was stitched with a firm tearaway and it has no puckering. And you all, we all stitch these lightweight dish towels all the time. So it's good to know that we can just use a regular medium weight firm tearaway, right? Mm -hmm. Now, so just to sum all that up on stable fabrics, when I say stable, I typically mean fabrics that don't stretch. You want to choose a good quality tearaway rather than a cutaway, just because aesthetically it's a better choice. So determine how much support you need, how cleanly the tearaway should release, and that will help you choose firm or soft tearaway. So my point is even heavier designs like this one can be stitched with a tearaway. A lot of times we want to err on the side of caution <laughs> and use a cutaway, don't we, Barbara? Mm -hmm. I've always been told like cutaway works the best. Just always use cutaway because <laughs> right. that's what the, all the industrial people use. And it's like, well, what if I don't want to clip around it every time I'm done? Right. <laughs> and, right. And, and with soft tearaway, you don't necessarily have to. So when we go into the cutaways, though, we do want to use those on unstable materials. And that typically means materials that stretch. And so um, we can use... Uh, these on knit fabrics primarily, like a fleece baby blanket is actually knitted. A lot of people don't realize that. Uh, knit children's apparel, onesies, uh, t-shirts, sweatshirts, golf shirts, sweaters are all unstable materials. So when we're working on these and we hoop in that cutaway, it needs to be all the way in the hoop. If even a small area isn't covered, really we should rehoop because that can create outlines being off track. So here's a couple of tests to do to make sure you have your knits hooped well. You want to run the snowplow test is one where you run your finger lightly across the surface of the hoop fabric. And if it bunches up or snow plows ahead of your finger, then you don't have that fabric properly tensioned. And the needle or the presser foot can push that fabric around. Another test is the lift test where you try to take your thumb and forefinger and lift that stabilizer off of the backing. It should be somewhat difficult to separate them. If it's easy to separate them and lift up that knit, then we have excess fabric in the hoop that can be pushed around. Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. So those help you know if you've got your knit well hooped. So the no-show cutaway is one of my favorites. A lot of people are afraid of it because it seems so lightweight, but I'm going to show you some examples here why it's a, a very stable uh, stabilizer. It's soft to the touch. It, it feels great against the skin and it has virtually no stretch. It's actually made out of nylon, even some, even though sometimes people call it poly mesh. So in this picture, you see why we love it on lightweight materials or light colored materials. So on the right, 
that design was stitched with no show. And on the left, the shadow of the backing is very clearly apparent. We don't want that on our embroidery. Here's an even better illustration of uh, uh, a, a detailed design with a lot of outlining. And when you look at the back of this embroidery, you can see that it was done with one layer of no-show that was properly hooped. Now I'm going to say, I like it for smaller hoop sizes. Okay. Like, like left chest and, and, you know, four, your four by four hoop up to five by seven. Um, and a lot of people use it for that in the hoop quilting uh, process. Now, here's a tip for you. If you use the fusible no-show, if you're a beginning hooper and you're worried about getting it hooped properly and you use fusible no-show, that will prevent stretching knits while you're hooping. So that is something good to, uh, to know uh, if you're worried about overstretching your hoops, which is uh, your knits, which is a common mistake. Polypro Performance is a cutaway that is a little firmer than no show, and it's perfect for those moisture wicking knits uh, that are very. Uh, they have a tendency to pucker. So this helps those outlines stay on track. It is something to be aware of that, you know, even nylon and this polypro, which is made out of polypropylene, are somewhat heat sensitive. So you don't want to, you know, cook them in your dryer <laughs> and you don't want to put an iron right on them really just because they're heat sensitive. You don't want to make them shrink up that way. So when we cut away our stabilizer, this is something I'm really uh, big on. Hold the item so that the back of the embroidery and the back of the fabric are both visible and use a short blade scissor, no longer than three to five inches. And leave about a quarter of an inch margin around the embroidery because that's what creates that platform for the embroidery to sit up on and it avoids a sunken appearance. And you've all seen that sunken embroidery, I'm sure, and it's not appealing. So leave that little quarter inch margin. Don't get, don't feel like you need to get right up next to the embroidery. So, uh, Sheer fabrics are one that um, I love to embroider and do a lot of, but the enemy on sheer fabrics is the um, stabilizer show through. See, uh, can you see the stabilizer behind that lettering and in the little swirls there? Oh, yes. Yeah, Let's that's that. not a good look, is it? Mm -mm, not at all. <laughs> and, you know, this is a very, as you can tell, a lightweight pillowcase. And so this is a little bay infant pillowcase. I don't believe that, you know, it is, um, uh, you know, going to be suitable to embroider with a regular tearaway. Uh, you could try a tear and wash, but ideally we have a better solution. And that is... Um, one that'll have absolutely no show through. Like here, I like to do these wedding handkerchiefs. And here you see uh, a, an example of, uh, of my wedding handkerchief that has no show through. And um, what I've used is sewing heat. Sewing heat's transparent. It looks like a water soluble film, but it is heat soluble. The heat source really does need to touch it directly uh, for it to uh, dissolve. You can use an iron, an applique iron, or a craft iron, and that just makes it turn into little balls and it just falls away. Uh, I iron over a Teflon sheet and I just use the edges of the 
uh, I, I use the Teflon sheet to clean the edges of my iron. In other words, people ask all the time, does that stick to your iron? Well, it sticks more to some irons than others. I'll say that. But if I've got that Teflon sheet there, I just run my iron over it and clean it off and it works great. So here's what I do. And, and here's my little wedding poem. And I have various versions of this for the bride to give to her mother and so forth. But this is from the bride to the groom's mother uh, to give, let's say, at the rehearsal dinner or sometime before the ceremony. And it says, your son is such a special man. I know that it is true. He would not be the man I love if it were not for you. So if upon our wedding day you shed a happy tear, just save it in this handkerchief and know I hold you dear. So that's one that always makes me, you know, tear up a little bit. It's so sweet and, and it's a wonderful gift. And you can put it on an inexpensive $2 handkerchief and it's worth its weight in gold. Uh, so what I have done is hoop the handkerchief in a five by seven inch hoop in this case with two layers of sewing heat. And after it's embroidered, I tear away the big pieces one layer at a time. I don't want to stress those uh, stitches. And then I just iron the remaining uh, stabilizer away. And this is so much better than using water, water soluble for this purpose. Some people use water soluble, but this is easier, faster. I, it's ready to go in the box. <laughs> and so I just love it. And um, as you can see, it really does a beautiful unpuckered uh, job as long as you use, uh, I'm going to say, you know, a normal density for lettering might be five points. I wouldn't even be, I, I don't even think it's a bad thing to go to five point, uh, on your density when doing something like this, it's going to cover. And as you notice, I used a silver gray thread. When I used to take orders for these, I would only, uh, do them in pastel or light colored threads. Two reasons for that. <laughs> One is they look nicer in a lighter density and uh, you don't have to trim the little jump stitch between the eye and the dot on the eye. In a dark colored thread, ah, that looks terrible. <laughs> so I'm kind of picky about that. Hey, uh, can we go down a little rabbit hole on that yeah, one? Sure. So I know that Dime, uh, an exquisite, um, which is a brand of Dime that's carried by all brands, um, carries a line of thread called Fine Line that you can use to do micro lettering. And then I know that there's some uh, software available. Can you talk oh, a little bit yes. about that? Oh, yes. I and love rabbit holes. You, you were, you really, uh, that's a great rabbit hole to go down because even though I, you know, lightly touched on it with the density, you are so right. You really want to use a proper thread, needle, and properly digitized letter for a small size. So, um, those letters are digitized so that they don't have a lot of the intersections where things cross over so that you get little knots like you might see on some of your small lettering. And so the openings don't close up. And that fine line thread is 60 weight instead of 40 weight, which of course is a lighter uh, weight and it sews much more clearly on these small letters. And the topic we're about to get to next is the needle. So the right needle for this is super important. I'm so glad you mentioned it because on these handkerchiefs, you need to use a sharp point needle and also a fine needle. Like Barbara mentioned, the 60 weight thread, you need a uh, 65 or 70 uh, blade size needle. So here's the thing. Most embroiderers use light ballpoint needles all the time. That's all they use. And most needles are um, 
that are sold as embroidery needles are like ballpoint. And up till recent times, it's been somewhat difficult in a flat shank needle to find the, uh, the sharp points. But if you look at the two together here, the ballpoint just has a rounder point which makes it better for knits and we'll see why in a minute the, but because it has a bigger footprint so let's call it it doesn't penetrate woven fabrics as cleanly as a sharp point so a sharp point has that smaller footprint that's going to do that handkerchief beautifully and it's also going to do a better job on any woven fabric your quilt cottons uh, if you if they have a tendency to pucker, switch. It may not be your backing. It may not be your stabilizer. It could be that you need a sharp point needle, right, Barbara? Mm -hmm. You know that's a rare, uh, has been a rare thing to find. But here's the reason we we don't use sharps all the time. A ballpoint is intended to spread the yarns in a knit, so if we used a sharp point on knits that could cut the yarn in that knit and you can see that's going to damage the structural integrity so to speak of the um, knit because once it may not look bad when you take it off your machine but it could cause that knit to unravel after it's laundered a few times so Sharp points are best used for woven materials, especially tough synthetic fibers like nylon and polyester. And that's where it really makes a difference. Here's a good example of that. This, <clears throat> this is two lightweight windbreakers. One of them stitched with a ballpoint needle, the lavender one, which is very puckered. And the black one, which is not perfect, but much better, was stitched with a sharp point needle. So it definitely makes a difference. And so uh, the best way, you know, you might say, well, gosh, <laughs> how do I have all those, uh, you know, sizes all the time? Because really we want to have the 65s up through the 90s and we need them in both point types in order to have the right needle for the right job. So uh, Dime makes a needle sampler, which has all of those sizes in it. So 65 nines and 70, as Barbara was uh, noting, are great for those finer threads and for fine detail, and also for lightweight fabrics because you wanna make that smaller footprint. 7511 is what uh, some people use all the time. Some people never use any other size, but believe me, they make the other sizes for a reason. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and the 8012 is another really popular size, good for slightly heavier fabrics, denim and towels and things like that. And then 8513 and 9014 are <clears throat> great for canvas, for caps, for webbing. Uh, so lots of reasons for any needle. And you never know what you're going to be embroidering. So to me, having that needle sampler is just Oh, that's wonderful. I see on this photo, uh, the front pack looks like it says EBBR on it. I'm very familiar with those <laughs> four letters because that's what we use in our multi-needle embroidery machines. And uh, we always use 7511. Um, and customers ask, hey, can I use that on my single needle embroidery machine, such as like the Luminaire, the Essence, the Stellaires, the... Um, dream machines the all, all of those so yeah you can use the ebbr needles in those machines it's just like a better grade i guess is that it is it's a lot it's a longer eye because that's what is required for your multi-needle um threading system and my the technicians barbara uh, i know you know a couple of those pretty well <laughs> the technicians tell me that they are better even on the single needle traditional tabletop machines uh as well and of course here's another 
few letters on the, that pack of needles. You see that S-E-S. That indicates that that is a light ballpoint needle. And the sharps, interestingly, don't say anything. <laughs> but the ones that say SES are the light ballpoint. So you can tell them apart that way. But <clears throat> you're right. The EBBR indicates that they are the recommended type and compatible with your multi-needle uh, machines as well as your uh, single needle. That is so interesting. And there's so many different like numbers and codes. And then there's the European and the American sizing. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that, that's another uh, interesting thing. The 65 is the European or in that number. The 65 is the European number. And the nine is the singer in the American system developed by singer. So, you, you know, in each number, you can use either or both you know, it doesn't matter. It, you, uh, your dealer's going to know what you're talking about, right, Barbara? Oh, yeah. But your go-to so, for embroidery is standard embroidery is 7511. It is. And as I say, some people don't use anything else ever. The only reason you might go to a, a bigger blade is because uh, if you're doing something that might cause that blade to bend or deflect, but you know, that would be very rare. The, and the finer one though, Barbara, like you mentioned that, um, 60 weight thread, I'll have to admit, I sometimes just use it in a 7511. Sure. Yeah. I don't always want to change my needle. <laughs> yeah. I hear you. Oh my so, God. So, so we did have a question yeah. um, from Debbie. This mm -hmm. is a good question. I get this one a lot. Right. Is there a rule of thumb on how often you should change a needle? Well, in you you know, that, it, is, right? that is a good question. You know, we we tend back, I come from a production background with big, you know, multi-needle, multi-head machines. And our rule was uh uh after three successive thread breaks, you know, on the same needle. Uh, that pretty much tells you that needle's life is spent. It's probably got a damaged point uh, and it's a good time to change it. Some people change their needle at the beginning of every new project, which is easy to do on a single needle machine. But on a multi-needle, you don't really know which needles you've used. So on a multi-needle in particular, after you've had two or three thread breaks in succession, change that needle. It's probably spent. Yeah. You can also, um, I think use your fingernail, like to kind of rub it on the front and back to see if there's any like you can, of sure, to see if there's a burr on the tip. But, you know, Barbara, also, in addition to the, a needle getting a burr, the point can actually just uh, wear down what they call attrition. And there's just less of a point and it's not working as well. Yeah. Oh, that's great information. And if you have a bent needle, uh, the like just if you look at the needle and it's visibly bent, that can um, create... Um, um, that can hit your needle plate that would need to be um, sanded out by uh, right, generally. right, and and um, and certainly it could also hit your your hook, which would cause your hook need to need to be sanded as well. So it's it's best to keep you know needles are inexpensive today. I mean, if you uh, uh, have any doubt at all, change that needle. Mm -hmm. Do needles go bad over time if you don't use them? No. No. Okay. Great questions, everyone. And I'm saving more for the end. So if I didn't get to it oh, yet. Yeah, yeah, because we're getting close to the end of this. <laughs> we just have a couple of uh, specialty stabilizers to cover. And uh, Fuse So Soft is one of my favorites because you can actually use it before or after embroidery. Like you can iron it onto the back of lightweight fabrics to give them more body or to prevent raveling. If you've ever done silk nupioni, you know what I'm talking about. And you can just iron it on there to give it more substance. And uh, you can also use it after embroidery to cover the embroidery um, 
and make it soft to the skin. And some children's wear manufacturers do this on every item. Uh, you can also cover your metallic thread with it. Or if you've got a piece of embroidery that the front looks good, but there's a bunch of loopy stitches on the back, well, Fuse So Soft can hide a multitude of sins and secure those stitches. Because if you had some satin stitches that didn't really lock that well, um, you can add some security to them by ironing this onto the back. And, and even with every time I do a fringe design, I add Fuso Soft to help lock those uh, stitch ends in place. So when we do use Fuso Soft, a lot of people recommend cutting it uh, with rounded edges and cut it with pinking shears uh, to keep it more invisible uh, and not able to be seen through the garment and not lift through the life of the garment. But one of my favorite tips about Fuso Soft, if you do a knit item and it's got some slight puckers, now this isn't going to fix something that's really badly puckered, but if you've got some light puckers, just gent put it on an ironing board wrong side out, gently pull those puckers out and apply that Fuso Soft and permanently uh, ease those out of the fabric so that when you when that Fuso Soft is ironed in place, those puckers can't reappear. See what I mean? Oh, that is so such a great idea because sometimes you don't know, you know, if something's going to happen and the puckers. So this is a good way to fix it. Right. Um, it really works well on knits and I've done it <laughs> quite a few oh, times. So it does work. Now, Erin Banco just said about the Fuso Soft, she said it's like adding a layer of lingerie to your embroidery. Oh, I love that characterization. So true, Joanne. It, it really is. It's very soft. It's a fusible trico, but it's got, which trico is used a lot in lingerie, but it is a fusible trico with a more aggressive adhesive than you find on what is in the bolt goods at the fabric store. So it will stay on there for the life of the garment. Uh, so the adhesive sew and wash. Deborah, uh, are you with us? Sorry? Looks like she's... Um... Oh, here we go. You're back. Okay. Oh, okay. Sorry. Sorry. sorry, sorry. No okay. Um, the adhesive sewing wash is great for fabrics that want to crawl away from the needle, like uh, pashminas. What it is, it's like the regular sewing wash. It's a mesh that dissolves in water very readily. So we can use it for items that are too small to hoop like this sock, but check out this knit cap. And I think this is my last example here, but I just love this uh, stitch out because I simply basted this knit cap to some, fuse, uh, some uh, adhesive sewing wash and put some water soluble topping basted to the top and look at that detail and how well that adhesive and the um, uh, mesh held that in place throughout the embroidery. And yet when it's removed, it's dissolved away completely. Very, very cool. I love that uh, for socks and all kinds of things that are going to be next to the skin and you don't want that you know tear away behind or other backing so as as joe as uh, barbara mentioned uh, a lot of this information is available on the embroiderer's compass uh, designed by me with 27 different fabric it's two-sided and not only does it show you your stabilizer recommendations you just dial it to the fabric and then it's going to tell you one or more stabilizers in this window. And down here in the second window, it shows you that my needle recommendation size and point type. And notice there's multiple sizes, multiple uh, uh, options on the needles and other comments from me 
uh, about working with that particular fabric. So I, I think you might enjoy having an embroider's compass if you don't already. That has saved me so much money <laughs> by <laughs> knowing what stabilizer to use for the project and not using the wrong one and then having to like rip it out and use different ones and trial and error. It is my go-to tool in my sewing room and i'm so grateful for it well thank you barbara and you know even i refer to it at times to see what uh i was most successful with the last time i embroidered that particular fabric because i don't do certain types of fabrics frequently oh my gosh it's so good <laughs> it's so good okay so i guess we can do some q a if you're up for that you bet Okay, cool. Um, a lot of folks are chiming in saying that they have the Borders Compass and it's awesome. And yes, I agree. Oh, <laughs> uh, let's see. The first one was, can you show me the compass? So that one's been done. Um, here's one from Joanne Banco. Is soft tear away never newer on the market than the crisp? Uh, yeah, it probably is. And it's really um, a more sophisticated tearaway, you know. Uh, but it's interesting that a lot of people get it and they think, oh, I don't like this. It doesn't tear away cleanly. Remember, that's your friend, the fact that it doesn't tear away like paper. You know, um, it's, it's going to let you do, like, I'll put it this way, Barbara. On a substantial knit, like a sweatshirt or uh, any heavier knit, you could consider it in place of a cutaway in many instances, depending on your design. So, wow, you said earlier, you don't always want to cut away. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Okay. So what about towels? I know everybody's <laughs> wondering about that. Heavy tear away? Yeah, I like heavy tearaway for a towel, but a medium tearaway would almost always be an, enough weight. You know, uh, a, just a firm tearaway on a towel is really all you need. Some people like a tear and wash, uh, which is fine, but I really only use that on things like napkins, sheets, uh, where I really don't want to see any trace of stabilizer. On a towel, you know, because they get washed more frequently, uh, your regular stabilizer is going to not be, uh, uh, your regular heavy or medium firm tearaway is not going to be visible after two or three washes. Yeah. So one thing to think about when you're doing towels is that they can be so big and bulky. Um, and they're even heavier now than I think that they ever were before. Yeah. Um, if you're using a multi-needle embroidery machine to do towels, please put your extension table on so that it doesn't tip the hoop forward and then that can distort your stitches. So that uh, white right tip for the embroidery machines is so important. And then just getting, um, what's the topper that uh, Exquisite makes? It's, it's just a water-soluble topper. Yeah. Water soluble topping. And it comes, you know, in a, it's a, it's about a 20 micron weight, which is nice. It doesn't break too easily, but it, it dissolves readily. Yeah. That's so great. And it just holds those loops down so that they don't come up through. Like if you're doing a satin stitch for a, a monogram, um, right. it won't show through there. So. Exactly. Great. <laughs> Uh, Patty says, I was told to crisscross the poly mesh. Your thoughts? Well, you know, I'll tell you, Patty, if you take a piece of uh, poly mesh, if it is the, the no show, which what I presume you're referring to, and you try to stretch that in any direction, it has virtually no stretch as compared to, uh, say, a traditional Pelon type cutaway. So I don't really find it necessary. Uh, now, in the early days, there was a poly mesh that was polyester and it did stretch. So if it was the original, that may be where that comes from. But today's uh, no-show, uh, which is what a lot of people call poly mesh, 
you saw my uh, Club Ed shirt with the single layer uh, on the back. There's no, I, I, Patty, what I say is you can't argue with the results. So, you know, if, if you get that result with one layer, hey, why use two? You know, it's, it's just as simple as that. All right, cool. All right. And Gwen says, I use Poly Pro for stretchy. Yep, that's mm -hmm. very wise. Poly Pro Performance is uh, is a little heavier and a little firmer than the No Show. So those treacherous moisture wicking shirts, you know, uh, Barbara, you're married. Your husband probably wears them. You know, men love that that moisture wicking uh, fabric, and it is very has a tendency to pucker. So uh, we need a good stabilizer in the pot. I sometimes use a, a no show, but really the poly pro performance is kind of the silver bullet for that. Yeah. Those moisture wicking shirts are great for companies. So all brand shirts are that moisture wicking material. And uh, we, you know, pop our allbrands.com logo on there and you know, it, we got to use the right stabilizer for it not to pucker. Cause when you're working, you don't want to like have some hot shirt on. So right. if you're right. in business, I think it, it would be a really good call to Very stock true. up on that. Very true. <laughs> oh, here's a good one from Joe. Joe says, will this be available at everything embroidery market? So I'm glad that you brought that up. So we are going to have some products from Dime at Everything Embroidery Market. Um, we're going to have that. Um, it's called Poly Patch Twill um, for making patches that we're really excited about. And that's oh, such I love fun. Poly Patch Twill, Barbara. Here's a here's a patch I made for my grandson to give to his father on Father's Day. Here was one I made first. It said Best Dad in the Galaxy. Um, here's a patch that I'm doing for the Texas Pinball Festival. I love making patches. Y you know, it's so stress-free because it's not a garment. You know, you can go. And Barbara, I know you love your skin and cut. I love mine too. I, I, I just couldn't do without it. And I cut my patches out on my scan and cut. So, and it, because the poly patch, uh, poly patch twill has a permanent backing on it. So it's got a nice smooth twill face and you can embroider uh, quite a lot of, I mean, as you can see, well, all the yellow on this is fully embroidered and it will take wow. it. <laughs> so cool. I love it. And you know, we have that other product, that patch attach that you can put on the back of your patches and make them iron on. Yeah. That is so cool. And it's so interesting. Like a lot, of, sometimes you have like some crazy material that there's just no way a needle's going to get through it. Make a patch, you know, you right, can, right. You can put a patch on anything. So that's really, um, hot right now for sure making patches but we'll have that we'll have the hoop mat we'll have king star metallic thread there i have our, our order here that's what i'm looking at uh we'll have the snap hoop monsters which we had a question earlier um a customer asked if you would use the snap hoops on towels oh sure Ta listen for me a uh, 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 snap hoop is, I mean, a towel is one of the number one reasons to use a snap hoop because, yeah. uh, because Barbara, you mentioned how heavy towels are getting. And a lot of times today, a towel is as thick as the wall on your hoop, literally on your standard hoop for a traditional uh, tabletop machine hoop. So a, a, a snap hoop monster Perfect for towels. Yes. Oh, great. We're also going to bring the Triumph needles with us there too. Great. And the weightless quilter tabletop. That's a oh, really yeah. cool product. And you know, you could use that on towels too. It's basically like arms that you connect to your table that have clamps on it and anything big that you're trying to embroider, it'll, like um, lift it kind of in the air so that when your embroidery unit is moving side to side, it kind of holds it out of the way 
So great. Right. And, and that's a very low cost solution for those heavier items. And it's uh, uh, anybody can use it in pretty much any uh, table. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh, here's one. <laughs> That's so funny. We were just talking about that. Reen Wilcoxon. Hey, Reen. Uh, she said, if you're using a single needle for heavy towels, I like to use Dimes Weightless Quilter, no drag. So there's a floor version and then there's the clamp style. And we carry both on our website, allbrains.com. Just search for Weightless Quilter. They are awesome. Here's a really good question from Joyce. Um, does the company, does the compass include all of the new stabilizers that she purchased a, a long time ago? Yeah, absolutely, because it includes basics and traditional stabilizers as well as new, the newer. Uh, it gets updated uh, from time to time to include all kind of new things. I've added new needle sizes. I've added new stabilizers uh, and, you know, uh, new fabrics. Sure. Very cool. Mary, uh, let's talk about some lace designs. Those are very popular. Well, Mary's asking if we use the heavy wash away. And I presume, Barbara, she's referring to the heavy water soluble film. OK, uh, as opposed to the sew and wash mesh that looks more like fabric. You can use either one, but the difference is, and, and this is just me and my uh, uh, opinion, but many of the lace designers that have been doing it a long time now tend to recommend the mesh type, the sew and wash, uh, the kind that looks like fabric versus the um, heavy water soluble because the heavy water soluble perforates and you're doing multiple passes back and forth. You know, you've got to do, you got to build up that that lace. And so uh, the water soluble mesh is now preferred. Yeah. Very cool. But okay. So use either. Absolutely. If you've got a bunch of heavy, uh, you can, but you, you know, you can do more multiple pieces in a bigger hoop using the mesh, whereas you might have to use a smaller hoop and do one at a time in the heavy water soluble, right? Yeah. Oh, I love it. So let's um, rewind a little bit back in time when we were talking about when you made the beautiful handkerchief with the tiny letters on it, you use the different thread. Um, and you were talking about using um, sewing heat on there. Mm -hmm. uh, right. Michelle's asking, uh, do you use that above or below? Below, just below. You don't need it above. Uh, it's a very smooth surface. So you only need it below, but I do use two layers. Um, and I remove them one at a time. Very cool. And Paula asks, uh, what are, what were the letter sizes that you that used? That to... is a good question. That's a 10 millimeter script, which means Barbara, that the uppercase letters are 10 millimeters, right? The lowercase letters are three or four millimeters. They're mm -hmm. very tiny. So, uh, that's the reason you need that specially digitized font rather than just reducing. Yeah. Yeah. So that answers Jody's question. She says small print letters are so hard to find in designs because Dime makes the program where you can create your own micro fonts. Right. Our word art and stitches has the um, micro fonts and there are at least 11 of them. Oh, but you great. just type in whatever you want to say. Yeah. Yeah. And Paula asked about the thread that you were using with those micro fonts. She asked if you could use 90, but you use 60, right? I use 60. You can use 90 weight. I mean, 90 weight is a lovely uh, effect on certain things. It's just that you're going to need to change the density probably to be a little more to get more coverage. But sure, you can use it. Absolutely. Beautiful thread. Very cool. Okay, here's one from Sue. And maybe you can answer this without checking your compass. <laughs> what is best for batiks? My microphone just fell ah! sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you wanted to chime in. It's live TV. Um, yeah. 
the batiks are really a lightweight woven fabric. So I'm going to say um, a for medium firm tear weight. Very. Oh my gosh. You are such a master. I love it. Uh, let's see. Okay. So we had a few questions about just Dime makes so many great products that we carry in our stores and on our website, allbrands.com. It's like solutions for sewers and embroiderers. But we had a lot of questions about the snap hoops, which okay. I love. Uh -huh. um, let's see. Uh, the question was, oh, um, I think it was just a, a standard question. Are they magnetic? Um, let's, I guess we could talk about what sizes are available, what machines are available. Well, <laughs> that's a, that's a broad question, but I will tell you, bear with me one minute. <laughs> I have mine over there. I might knock over the camera if I go get it. <laughs> Thanks, Deborah. Now this one is oh, the biggest. This one is a nine and nine by fourteen. We make that ten and a half by sixteen, Barbara, the, the largest for um, the uh, the large hoop machines. But we also make four by fours and five by sevens. You know, and the way you need to think about the size you want in a snap hoop. Uh, of course, some people want them all, but like if I were quilting, this would this is my choice. I like to do my edge to edge quilting in this nine by 14. Of course, I could do it in a 10 and a half by um, uh, 16 as well, uh, but I generally do use this one. And then um, I, I use for towels, I use my five by seven, you know, but there's all the sizes that most of the sizes that you can get a standard hoop in, you can get a snap hoop monster in. Oh, very Especially cool. for brother machines. I know. I have the, the biggest hoop for my Luminaire, and um, it's awesome. Especially when you want to move your fabric and not take the whole hoop off of the machine. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, because you don't have to. You can just lift this part and hang it over the the arm of the machine and and or the whatever they call that the harp or whatever and it will uh just let you scoot your fabric and then bring it back down again oh my gosh i love it okay uh oh you're so funny um so if you guys haven't yet please go ahead and uh comment hashtag all brands because i'm about to do a giveaway for a 50 dollar allbrands.com e-gift card on our website allbrands.com if you want to shop for some of these great um, products by Dime. But today we talked about um, some stabilizers. So we'll just kind of bring those up on the screen. And if you're interested in purchasing any of those, there's a link in the description of this video uh, that you can click and see all of the products that we talked about that were stabilizers and needles today. <laughs> I didn't add the little rabbit holes yet, but I'll probably go in afterwards. <laughs> So we discussed uh, the firm tearaway, and that's the one, okay, okay, here's quiz time. That's the one where when you do the satin stitch, it perforates the edge, and it, right, and it right. cleanly yes. comes off. Um, right, correct. And then the medium soft tearaway is the one that's has the more soft fibers. It does. It has those longer, softer fibers that cling to the edges of your embroidery even until you put that outline on. Yeah. And no show. I know this is what all of the big design companies use when we have our big events. They're just, they say, use no show, right. <laughs> you know? <Yeah. laughs> so this is such a versatile item. Poly -po -pro, Pro Performance. So that's what you use on your athletic wear. That's like the wicking material. Right. And more. Check your compass for sure. Fuse so soft. Okay. You may have to remind me about this. That one. was what we ironed onto the back side of the embroidery to, to take those puckers out and also on make it soft on baby skin. Cool. Adhesive sew on wash. This one's great because it's adhesive, so it holds the fabric in the back right. and it washes away with water. Right. And then sew in heat. 
you put it on. Um, is it adhesive or? No, it's it's adhesive. just a clear, um, just a clear heat soluble material. Yeah, so you don't have to get it wet to take right. away. Right. You just do it with heat. I love it. It's my, I don't use it as a topper. I use it as a backing. Yeah. Okay. And then we talked about the triumph needles. So sharp is for um, woven fabric. Right. right. And ballpoint is for stretchy fabric so that you yeah. don't cut through the, you don't ever want to pull a thread on something that's stretchy because it's just going to keep going because <laughs> it's a knit. Um, and then you have the um, special pack, a sampler. The sampler's the ticket. Let me tell you, I I would not want to be without my sampler. <laughs> okay, everybody's begging for a PowerPoint too. I don't know if there's. <laughs> I'll I'll look into that, guys. Okay. Um, I know this is such good information. Everyone's loving it. Great. <laughs> All right. Well, how about a giveaway? Absolutely. Okay. All right. And drum roll, please. Our winner is Elizabeth Smith. Oh my gosh, you were uh, you were commenting during the live. I saw you. Congrats. Congrats. Please email me at events at allbrands.com to claim your prize with your name, email address, uh, and address and phone number, and I'll get that in our system and send it over to you. So I hope this was inspiring for everyone, educational, and just know that All Brands um, carries all of Designs and Machine Embroidery products on our website, um, and we hope that you take advantage of the amazing products that they offer. Thank it's you. It's been Deborah. a lot of fun. It's been a lot of fun, Barbara. I enjoy uh, being here with you. Wish I could get down to Baton Rouge uh, mm -hmm. and see you in person one day soon, I hope. Yeah. Well, I hope that everybody comes to see us. If you're available next week, we have a big show and it's the big embroidery show in the South. It's going to be in Lafayette, Louisiana at the Cajun Dome. Lafayette is where you can eat the best food in the world. I don't know if you've ever been, but oh my gosh, they have the best Cajun food that you'll ever eat. Um, just bring your stretchy pants for sure. I'm just kidding. I uh, think that's so, where I had a crawfish pie one time. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. my goodness. So uh, I'll be there with Courtney and we'll have a brother educator there, a Juki educator there. And uh, Becky Thompson from Power Tools with Thread is going to be there as well. And uh, we'll, we'll have some dime products uh, and some sales on that for you to peruse. So that's next um, Friday is the classes. So you pre-register for the classes. And the show is actually on Saturday and Sunday. So please come and see us there. So, oh my gosh, thanks, Deborah, so much. You're awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Enjoyed it, Barbara. Thanks, yeah. everyone, for watching. Thank you. I hope you all have a great day and use your stabilizers. <laughs> Bye.